it wasn't for her. And for whatever reason, this is such a subjective business. And other agents as well agreed. I've been rejected. Oh my. People say they could wallpaper their house. I could wallpaper my neighborhood with the amount of rejections on books that I have. Why didn't you give up? Like all these slaps in the face. What was the persistence? How did you get up every day and go, I'm going to keep going with this? Nothing in me ever wanted to give up because I wanted it so much. I am so stubborn. I believed it would happen. I believed it would happen. I didn't know. I didn't know it was going to take 20 years, but I believed in my soul that it was going to happen. And if I would, if I gave up, I would regret it for the rest of my life. I had nothing to lose by, by continuing and, you know, to keep going. And I am extremely lucky then and now to have a huge support system of friends and fellow writers and family who were, you know, there with me saying, you can do this, I believe in you, which I think is such a massive thing to propel you forward. You need people to say, I, I believe in you and for you to believe in yourself. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 275 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Samantha M. Bailey. Sam is the author of Woman on the Edge, a USA Today and number one national bestseller. Her second novel, Watch Out for Her, was an instant number one national bestseller. Her books have sold in 11 countries to date. Samantha is a journalist and freelance editor. Her writing has appeared in Now Magazine, The Village Post, The Thrill Begins, and The Crime Hub, among other publications. She lives in Toronto, where she can usually be found tapping away at her computer or curled up on her couch with a book. I'm honored that I have had the opportunity to know Sam for 10 years and to have watched her work so hard and rise to this well-deserved success. We have a fantastic conversation. She chides me for calling her Samantha instead of Sam because she thought I was mad at her because she only ever, only ever has someone call her that when they're angry with her. But it is a wonderful conversation, an inspiring conversation about an author who would not give up. We also talk about the craft of writing and unreliable narrators and her perspective on that. And it is a wonderful conversation. And that's coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows independent authors an opportunity to get their audiobooks out into a global market of more than 43 retail and library platforms. Later on in this episode, you're going to hear me praising the awesome audiobook for Sam's latest thriller, Watch Out For Her, because I love audiobooks. I love listening to audiobooks. I'm a slow reader, and I really enjoy a good performance for audiobooks. So if you're a writer and you're looking to get audiobooks out into the market, you can use Findaway Voices Marketplace to find an amazing narrator. You can also use their tool where they'll actually assign a project manager to you. You put in an RFP, and they'll go through the thousands of narrators and pick between the five and ten that they think are best suited for your project. Or if, like in the case of some of my own projects, you've found narrators that you love working with, I hire them directly, I pay them directly, and then I just upload the produced files directly to Findaway Voices. It's all about choice. It's all about options. It's all about control. And you're in control when you use Findaway Voices, no matter how you use Findaway Voices to get your audiobook out into that global 
market. And if you want to see how you can leverage audiobooks as an author, you can check out Findaway Voices over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And that is the sponsor for this podcast. But I also want to thank the patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections and let you guys know that in the patron feed today, and I'm recording this on Thursday, November 3rd, 2022, there's a new episode in the patron-only feed, so check your RS feed for that. And it is basically an ad read, an ad read. It is an article read of uh, an article that uh, Mike Shatskin just shared on uh, his website, and it's his thoughts on the DOJ the uh, Department of Justice um, prevented uh, the ruling of Simon and Schuster being merged into Penguin Random House, and so it's an interesting perspective on what this means. And and Mike comes with open mindedness about indie publishing, but he comes with uh, extensive knowledge of the traditional publishing in- industry. He has some very awesome insights there, and I also reflect a little bit on. My own thoughts and what this could mean for both traditionally published authors and indie published authors. And again, that's as a thank you to my patrons who get extra reflections, extra episodes, and I plan on doing more of those. So please let me know, dear patrons, if you like those extra episodes that are sort of reflections on what's going on in the industry with insights. And I want to say a huge thank you to all the patrons who support this podcast. Your extra support of this podcast means so much to me. In terms of a personal update, and this is harking back to audiobooks a little bit, I was fortunate enough to have had my uh, audiobook narrator, narrator, one of my audiobook narrators, so Sarah Sampino, who I found through TikTok, uh, did a, a live event last week where she was doing a ghostly stories just before Halloween and she featured uh, a couple of my short horror stories and it was so awesome that during the live rating somebody uh, I think there were over a hundred people watching it live on uh, TikTok and, and speaking of TikTok Samantha mentions TikTok in this episode and a cool filter that has to do with unreliable narrators so there's a little little teaser for that but um Anyways, uh, Sarah was doing this on TikTok, and one of the commenters commented that they went and bought um, all uh, eight of the books in my Nocturnal Scream series, which is basically, I call them a a series of digital chapbooks, three or four stories on a theme all together in all sort of horror slash Twilight Zone-like style. And and it was so cool, but Sarah's preparing to read Lover's Moon that was co-authored with Julie Strauss. And I, now Julie and I did do the read by the read by the author's version because um, this is so much was going on in Sarah's life, including getting married and going on her honeymoon, <laughs> that even though Scott Overton did the Michael Andrews parts, uh, dual narrator, and again, Samantha and I talk about the, the, the two narrators in, in her latest novel, but so Scott does Michael and Sarah's going to be the voice of Gail, but Julie and I thought it would be fun to do a podcast, free podcast version read by the authors, um, and so that's available on Lover's Moon, but the... Um, the, the cool thing is that Sarah's going to be reading from Lover's Moon her scenes, the, or the chapters uh, from Gail, Gail's perspective, on TikTok Live. And I'm hoping that that brings new readers who are interested in, because they're going to hear, um, you know, the, the awesome chapters Julie wrote, and Gail's awesome voice, and, and obviously Sarah's awesome interpretation of that. And, um, and, and that's cool. That's cool. And, and I will link to an episode where I interviewed Sarah. Uh, earlier uh, in in this um, on the show notes over at starkreflections.ca so that was a really cool thing another cool thing that happened is as i heard from uh, leanne uh, cusack from ctv news in ottawa now leanne had featured liz and i when we were doing the parody videos um she had featured uh the parody video liz and i did uh, stuck in this house here with you based on the steelers wheel song and then we did a medley album and leanne had me back on for a Halloween uh, uh, afternoon broadcast, and it was so phenomenal. It was basically 10 minutes, almost 10 minutes of of getting to talk with her about some spooky things, and so I'm very appreciative of that. And that was just coming off of the high of being at Frightmare in the Falls, in Niagara Falls, Ontario, a horror con, 
and uh, being there with the table, having such a great time selling so many books. Now, the interesting thing about this is the logistics of this is that even though I made really good money, I sold a lot of books. I had people buying the entire you know, Canadian Werewolf series, etc. I sold out of Haunted Hamilton and I sold out of uh, one of the uh, Haunted Hospitals. I pretty much broke even. I, I mean, I made about $50 extra after my expenses of the, the table, the rent, table rental and the hotel. I didn't even incorporate the cost of my meals, the cost of gas, etc. So even though it was relatively break even, I look at events like that as marketing. It was a great marketing opportunity. I was there. I had lots of people see my books. Lots of people check them out. So, and and I get a chance to interact with fans. I I, I had uh, it was so awesome. I had uh, somebody who's uh, a big fan of my Canadian Werewolf series show up with three of my books in hardcover because he wanted me to sign them. And and I thought that was so cool. And so again, an event like that isn't necessarily just about making money. The event is about marketing and networking and connecting with readers. Now, the last uh, thing about my personal update is it's November uh, 2022, and I'm participating in NaNoWriMo. And uh, back to Julie Strauss, you know, we had such a great time co-authoring the ro- paranormal romantic comedy Lover's Moon that um, this next novel in the series, Hex in the City, requires michael's point of view for some chapters and gail's point of view so it's it's not a romance this time it's it's a action adventure thriller but um yeah hex in the city will feature uh, a, a stream of, of what's going on what michael's up to and then a, a separate stream of gail and her separate adventures and they need to be told from each person's first person perspective and i will have a reflection about those first person um, um perspectives because of something really cool that Samantha says in this interview and um, so uh, the interesting thing because uh, because of the way we have a schedule set up and Julie and I are uh, doing the alternating chapters we're taking uh, weekends off and um, and and because the way it doesn't overlap effectively with November we're going to be finishing up uh, about two weeks into December for NaNoWriMo, for November, I want to get 50,000 words written. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a combination of writing Hex in the City during November, but I'm not going to get to 50,000 words just on that. I will get to 50,000 words if I include that and other writing projects. So like I've done in previous NaNoWriMo's, I'm not worried about just doing only one novel. I'm worried about, okay, different writing projects. What am I going to write on? What am I going to work on? And I just slap them into a tracking document for NaNoWriMo so I know how many words I've written. So even though I'll be working in a shared manuscript back and forth with Julie, I'll just copy and paste the new things I add into that tracking document, separate tracking document. Same thing for other projects. I'll just copy and paste them, slap them in to the tracking document. And anyway, that's what I'm going to do. If you're participating in NaNoWriMo, I'd love to hear about that. You can leave comments over at starkreflections.ca. Let me know what you're working on and what strategies you may be employing because it could be something that helps other people along. Also, if you're doing NaNoWriMo and uh, and you're not off to a good start, we're only a few days into it. This, you know, this uh, by the time this episode gets released, you're only three or four days into it. It is not too late to, to, to pick up uh, the slack. I'm a little bit behind myself. I'm not panicked. Normally, I'm uh, 10 or 15,000 words ahead early in the month, and then I kind of trail off, and then I come back at the very last minute. It's not always a consistent 1,667 words per day, um, and that's okay. You can have uh, good days. You can have bad days. Every single word you put down is important. Every single word you put down is that much closer to the end of your manuscript. Do not give up on yourself, my friend. So that is it for the introductory matter. That is it for my personal update. Why don't we together, why don't the two of us go together? Come on, put your arm in mine. Let's walk over past this bumper and into the conversation with Samantha M. Bailey or Sam, as she prefers that I call her. Hey, Sam, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Hi, it's so good to see you, Mark. It's been so long. I, I know we saw each other in person, you know, a month ago, but but it's been so long since we've chatted. And and the last time I had you on the podcast was um, a few years ago, I think. It was a couple of years ago, at least. Was it pre-pandemic yes. even? It was 
pre-pandemic and I did not know how to use Zoom, so I couldn't even turn on my camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, this time we've got video evidence that you're willing yes. to talk to me. Okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. I am so excited about Watch Out for Her. Now, this is your latest thriller. You got two number one best-selling uh, thrillers, Standalone. And uh, let, let's first talk about, so Watch Out for Her was released earlier this year. It was a number one Globe and Mail bestseller, and it was a number one Toronto Star bestseller. You were riding the number one spot. How many weeks in a row were you on that list? Number one, I'm not sure, in total 13 weeks. 13, 13 weeks. weeks on the top 10 yeah. bestseller. Like, oh my God, that is fantastic. So you couldn't walk into a bookstore in Canada, a good bookstore <laughs> in Canada, and not find this book on the shelf, right? Primarily, I think I was sending you pictures of different bookstores I was going into. Look, and it was on like Shoppers Drug Mart. It was it was on the on the shelf there. It was on the shelf there. It was at Walmart, Costco. It was a buyer's pick, and so oh, awesome! It's and the bookstore, like just everyone is so good to me there. You know, they 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 put it where everybody can see it, and they're so hugely supportive. And then. People like you send me shots. Those are my favorite thing in the world because I can't get to all the bookstores and I can't right. see it all. And so when someone sends me a shot, um, especially, you know, indie bookstores, I love when indie bookstores in small towns, people yeah. find it. Oh, I love it. it. It means the world to me. It's got to be a little bit surreal though, right? Oh, it's 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 100% surreal. I've talked to you about this before and we've known each other for 10 years you've known me since the days of wanting to be in traditional publishing yeah. desperately, yeah. but nobody wanted me <laughs> or well, no one wanted the books I had written at that point. And so it was, it was 20 years. I worked 20, so 20 years. years to get to where you are. So people who other writers who may be looking at you and being jealous of your success, <laughs> don't recognize the iceberg, right? <laughs> You're just seeing the tip. You're not seeing all that work. So hang on a second. 20 years. So obviously, so let's go back to Woman on the Edge, which was, was that released in 2019 or 2020? So it was released November 2019 in Canada and the UK. Okay. And then in the US, it was released, released, sorry, March 3rd. Oh no. A week before the pandemic hit in 2020. It was. And yet it was still time. a number one, uh, number USA Today, number one bestseller, wasn't it? Well, wasn't it? It wasn't number one in the U.S. That would be. Oh, I mean, oh, sorry. It was not, on the USA Today. It was on the USA Sorry, today sorry my apology. I got excited. Yeah, yeah. that <laughs> would during be the I pandemic. Mean, yes. Uh, wow. Yes. During during the pandemic, it it did hit the USA Today bestseller list. Um, and I will. I'll be perfectly transparent. Um, there was a book bub um, deal that helps. for it, <laughs> and so it it helps immensely because to try to reach the biggest market in the world, um, you know, there, there does have to be something behind it generally, right. whether it's a sale or, or it's some kind of pick or something really exciting um, and fortunate happens. So let's talk a little bit about that because these are traditionally published. It's not like you can just go, oh, I'm going to drop the price and do a promo. Yeah. I mean, you've got an agent, you've got an editor, you've got probably publicists. I, I think I met one of your publicists uh, at, at uh, a book fair not that long ago. <laughs> yes. And and so it all has to be coordinated uh, because, yeah. you know, big New York publishers and, and Toronto publishers, <laughs> big mm -hmm. publishers um, have to deal with this. So, so because you had three different rights, does this mean that the same publisher picked it up, but with different so you, like, look, go back to Woman on the Edge. There was the Canadian and UK edition, where, which were simultaneously released. Mm -hmm. You have different editors. How did that work? So Woman on the Edge sold in um, uh, 11 territories so far. Wow. And so I actually have 11 different editors. There's 11 um, contracts? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my agent, my agent is Jenny Bent of the Bent Agency. She's a rock star. She's just, she is just incredible. So she secured, yeah, rights in 11 territories for me. Wow. Um, but how it works is, so um, I have a Canadian publisher, uh, Simon Schuster Canada, for Watch Out for Her and Woman on the Edge, and they yes. are phenomenal. My Love them. I got, a, I got an arc of that first book. I was so excited to get it. <laughs> oh, I was, I was so excited. My editor, fun fact, for both of uh, my first two books is Nita Prose author of The Maid. Really? That's your editor? That's my editor. Oh yes. my goodness. 
Awesome. Yes. Yeah. I just have this absolutely, I have this amazing, amazing team for, the, for those two books. And so, you know, Jenny and I had edited the book together. And then when it sold, Nita and I edited it. Nita's exceptional. And then um, Cherise Hobbs uh, was my editor for Women on the Edge in the UK. And so we did edits and we, we all collaborated right. together. And then with the foreign editors, they take generally the final copy and they will offer notes and suggestions if something doesn't work in a different language because there are things like my title might be odd in a different language. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so you're talking about 11 territories. You're talking about other languages besides English or you're yeah, talking so, about UK yeah. English versus American English. Yeah. So I think, so nine different, nine different languages. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Because woman on the edge might not translate uh, verbatim. It might have to be something that, yeah, I get you. That makes sense. Yeah. And woman on, and sorry, and watch out for her. It is three or four territories at this point. So oh, in no. if, languages. So that has also been, uh, it's unreal, not even surreal. It is unreal. So let's go back to this long, hard climb because you, you, when did you find Jenny? And you and Jenny probably worked on selling that first book for quite a while, right? Uh, the selling happened fairly quickly. The editing was three and a half years, but how did I find Jenny? Yeah. I found Jenny 20 years ago. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> okay. And I sent Jenny three other books before Woman on the Edge and she very kindly passed. Really? Three other okay, books. so she's so like, she's like, yes, I like it, but not enough. I don't think I can sell it. Whatever. Yeah, it was just, it right. wasn't for her. Right. And and it, it, for whatever reason, this is such a subjective business, and other agents as well agreed. I've been rejected. Oh my! I I people say they could wallpaper their house. I could wallpaper my neighborhood <laughs> with the amount of um, rejections on books that I have. Received. Why didn't you give up? Like all these slaps in the face. What was the persistence? How did you get up every day and go, I'm going to keep going with this? Nothing in me ever wanted to give up because I wanted it so much. I am so stubborn. I believed it would happen. I believed it would happen. I didn't know. I didn't know it was going to take 20 years, but right. I believed in my soul that it was going to happen. And if I would, if I gave up, I would regret it for the rest of my life. I had nothing to lose by, by continuing and, you know, to keep going. And I am extremely lucky then and now to have a huge support system of friends and fellow writers and family who were, you know, there with me saying, you can do this. I believe in you, which I think is such a massive thing to propel you forward you need people to say i i believe in you right. and for you to believe in yourself that's awesome and so you've had you have that very supportive family yes. a community of writers that you probably connect with etc yes yes okay that's uh, that's kind of let's go back to the books themselves when i first saw the cover for um watch out for her i went Wait a second. I recognize that yellow coat. Was that <laughs> on purpose? Because there's completely standalone. I was like, is there a tie-in? And is there a tie-in that's like, is there a secret <laughs> Easter egg that I didn't pick up on that there is it's the same universe? Or <laughs> I, I have to say two things to that. One is the second my daughter saw it. She is 12. My daughter saw it. And she said, that looks like it by Stephen King. <laughs> God, like, yeah, watch out for that. <laughs> yes. And I was like, oh, maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, but, um, and then I have, I have these amazing readers, uh, Sandra and Jill Jemmett, who, when I was doing Motive, which was the Thriller Mystery Festival uh, with the Toronto International Festival of Authors over the summer, they brought me the most beautiful gift, these two notebooks with um, girls with yellow raincoats on the cover. <laughs> and I love that. So the, the yellow raincoat was absolutely not kind of an, an intentional choice when, my, when the cover was, was sent to me for watch out for her, for approval, I will admit fully at first, I was like, yellow raincoat. Actually, no, my first thought was, oh, I love this cover. I love it. It was everything to me that encapsulates this book. I loved everything, the colors. I liked that the colors were similar to Woman on the Edge. Right. And, but the yellow raincoat, I was like, 
hmm, will people think this is a sequel? Will they think? And in the end, we, we talked about it because we talk about everything openly and we yeah. all decided maybe in some way it maybe gives me a brand. Okay, again, is okay. that not is that a bad thing? No, that it would be a cover that's, you know, a Samantha M. Bailey cover that it's recognizable. Um, the, the cover, always going to have to be a little, little yellow on the cover somewhere. It's always going to have to be a little yellow. Everyone says that. Um, and it, to me, the cover, I just, I loved it and I still love it. So yes, many people have asked and I, I laugh every time because yes, it's a <laughs> yellow raincoat. So let's set up for anyone who is not lucky enough to have read this amazing, yeah, I call it a domestic thriller, I guess, right? That's, sure, that's sure. The, the, the specific kind of thriller it is. Uh, set it up for us. What's this, uh, what is Watch Out For Her about? So Watch Out For Her is the story of a mother named Sarah Goldman. She's middle-aged. Her son, Jacob, is almost seven years old. And she's been a stay-at-home mother his entire life. And she gets to the point where she has lost herself. She wants to find that piece of herself that's missing. And she's a photographer. So she wants to return to her first passion, which is photography. So she decides to hire a uh, 22-year-old babysitter, a med student named Holly Monroe, to watch her son for the summer. And at first, it's, it's a perfect arrangement. Jacob and Holly adore each other. And Sarah and Holly find something in each other that they're both missing. They're both longing to be seen. And they give that to each other. And they bond very quickly, too quickly. And then Sarah sees something that she can't unsee. And she feels that she needs to escape from Vancouver where they live to Toronto with her family and get as far away from Holly as possible. But when they arrive to their new home in Toronto, she finds hidden cameras everywhere. And she has to wonder if Holly isn't so far behind after all. And, and I, the, the camera motif was just so powerful because you have the hidden cameras, the discovery of the hidden cameras but then you have Sarah's passion for photography and there's a lot of stuff that's seen through specific lenses. Yes. Uh, obviously. And, and perception of other and perception of self. I mean, there's so much going on here. The other thing I think that's going on is um, a really great example of narrators and it's told from two perspectives, right? You get Sarah uh, yes, yes. and Holly's perspective. So alternating chapters with different perspectives an unreliable narrator, right, is, is, a, is a key element. Can you talk a little bit about, about that sort of unreliable narrator aspect? So I find this so fascinating. I could talk about this for hours because to me, I am never planning to create an unreliable narrator. Really? No, because to me, when it comes to these characters, it is from their points of view. Holly's point of view is thir third person, um, close third person, uh, present tense. And um, Sarah's is first person, um, present tense. And they are telling their own stories the way they perceive them. So it is not unreliable to them. Yes. It is how they perceive what is happening around them, what is happening to them and what's happening inside them. Right. So, yeah. So, so I, I find the whole term unreliable narrator so interesting because I'm not, I don't ever want to trick my reader. It's never my intention. Right. I just want my reader to follow their journeys as the characters see themselves. And I'm glad you said that. That's so perfect because pretty much every single narrator is unreliable because in this case, we get to see two different perspectives of how these two different women see what's been happening. And, and you're saying, wait a second, she said this happened, but from this person's perspective, that happened. What's the reality? I, I discovered this in, uh, I co-authored a, a book with a good friend of mine and we had to write this, back, go to this backstory 
and my main character tells first person past tense narration that's the whole story and what we realize is oh he just remembered it wrong so so we kind of like we needed to change some details we're like well of course he just remembered it wrong you know he has man eyes <laughs> that kind of thing right or <laughs> man ears he, he heard it pro- improperly it exactly there's there's um this new tiktok filter I, I actually don't have my own account but i'm obsessed and addicted to watching it <laughs> there's a filter how other people see you as opposed to how you see yourself Oh, okay. And it's so interesting. And, 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 and it's a filter how, how differently people see you than the way you see yourself. And with that, there's the idea that no two people have the same memory of the same experience. Yeah. So that is, that is true. But, but again, that unreliable narrator aspect, a narrator aspect is something that a lot of people really enjoy in a thriller because mm-hmm. you want to trust and believe in the story that the person's telling you, but you also have to take everything with a grain of salt and go, what am I getting? What sort of tainted perspective am I getting here? Uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff. I think as a reader, when I go into a thriller, I don't trust anyone ever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may, I may, you know, I'm compelled to follow them and I'm, you know, so interested and intrigued, but I don't trust anyone at all. <laughs> there, so there's, there's this skill you have in getting into the heads of both of these different women and sharing their stories and how they inter- interweave. And then I was lucky enough to listen to the audiobook version narrated by two absolutely brilliant performers who, who nailed the voices, just got it down pat. Can you talk a little bit about what, like, what was your first experience when you first heard samples from? I, I knew immediately uh, Hillary Huber and Joy Osmansky. I, it was immediate. It was like that, that, that gut punch of there it, there it, um, their voices to hear your, I, I, again, I will confess, I never listen to audiobooks. I'm a very visual person. I love music. I am, I am music obsessed. I'm a music addict, but right. when it comes to reading, I need to, t- I need to touch it. I need to feel it, um, to absorb it and immerse myself in it. And it is always weird, I think, as an author, maybe, maybe not for all authors, but it's weird to hear someone else read the words that you've written because you hear them in your head a certain way. You hear the characters' voices a certain way, you see them a certain way. But it was like they were they they were born to read for these characters. They were they they just fully embodied these characters. And I'm oh, so yeah. grateful to them. And, um, and just, I, I'm so thrilled that they, that they are the narrators for the book. Yeah. It's, it's one. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well done. Thank you. Would you, you've done in-person events because sort of, we've gotten sort of to the end of sort of this phase in the pandemic <laughs> where we're getting together in person again. Yeah. Um, there, so when you do uh, in-person events, have you d- had a cho- chance to do readings and how do you, how do you pick? Because you're do you read like one from Sarah's perspective and one for a piece from Holly, or how do you do the reading? I am petrified to give anything away. Okay. Um, petrified. <laughs> it's so hard when you write thrillers and when you talk about them. I I generally only read from the first chapter. You just read from what? The first chapter. The first chapter, because that's previewable online, anyways. <laughs> so yeah. you just go from okay. All right. I was just kind of curious because how do you pick? There's so much, so much in there. Yeah. And I don't, yeah, it's, it's, it's so hard that I really, I'm so sorry. I do take the easy route. I don't want, yeah, I don't want to put anything into a reader's heads. Readers, I mean, they're, they're so smart and they yeah. pick up on things very quickly. And so you have, so I'm just so careful. <laughs> I'm just so, <laughs> so careful. Well, I'll be honest with you because my experience with this book was the audio book. I think I read the blurb, the synopsis. But I didn't need to. I knew Samantha M. Bailey had a new thriller out and I was going to love it. That's mm-hmm. all I knew, right? It's kind of like you're one of the buy on site authors like Michael Connolly, Linwood Barkley, Samantha M. Bailey. Oh my God, please. Really <laughs> I'm going to read it right away. That's that's because I mean, the experience has been 100% awesome. But I didn't really attend to what it was about. I just started listening to it. So I came completely fresh and going, okay. Sarah, 
move into Toronto, their family, and they're moving to a new house. And it's this new, like, you know what I mean? And then, and then you hit me and hit me and hit me and hit me all the way through. I was like, Oh my God, what are you doing to me? <laughs> yay. Yay. Oh, that's, I, that's, and that's what I love to do. And it, it, it takes so much rewriting and revising and editing, and it takes a, a great editor and great critique partners. Right. And, and for me, you know, a really solid outline to make sure that I can hit all of those marks so that I can, right. whether I start quickly or I start slowly, because it's a very different feel like for me between Woman on the Edge and Watch Out for Her. Yeah. Woman on the Edge is freight train explosive. Yeah. And then Watch Out for Her to me is more slow burn where, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm really, I was trying to like, you know, I'm smoothing, easing you into it. And then hope, hopefully, bam. Yeah same thing and then hopefully back was the tapestry hopefully. uh the the tapestry of the of the play between the the, the two stories is different yeah the, yeah than than in the first one which is i mean and the premise of just for anyone just for, who may may not have been lucky enough to listen to our previous episode which we'll have links to in the show notes reflections.ca. <laughs> but uh women on the edge you know the the premise basically is and i'll let you deliver it since you've had practice <laughs> oh my gosh i haven't done this in so in long years. oh i'm <laughs> putting you on the spot yeah, all right let's see do you remember this book <laughs> oh my gosh so the book the first line is take my baby morgan kincaid is standing on a su subway platform she is a traumatized woman who um, is trying to get her life back together and she just wants to go home from work at the end of a long day and a complete stranger, completely disheveled, approaches her with a baby in her arms. And she says, take my baby. She thrusts her baby into Morgan's arms, says Morgan's name. And the woman jumps in front of an oncoming train. Bam. And that is the freight train. And that's, <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. And you're like, okay, <laughs> what's going on? Uh, again, phenomenal thriller. So. You've got okay. these two home runs, these two amazing thrillers. You've got to be working on another thriller, right? I, I, I am. And I, I, I won't lie. You know, the pressure from one book to the next to the next. My agent uh, brilliantly said and wisely said, whether it's your first book or your seventh, it never gets easier. Yes. Um, and I think it actually just gets harder in some ways. Everything is hard in publishing. Yeah, no, no one, no one I've ever met in publishing says, "Yeah, it was so easy. I got my book deal. I became an overnight success." And every book I, I wrote after that just flowed out of my fingers, and it was gold. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's not at all how the situation is. Um, the reality is that every book is a new uh, beginning. Every book feels like you're learning all over again. All over again, you take all the lessons you've learned, and with every book I write, my, my ultimate, ultimate goal is to write the very best book I can to compete with nobody else but myself right. and to learn and grow. I just want to be a better writer every single time, every single time. So I am working on another thriller. <laughs> <laughs> I will say it is currently set in Michigan, um, which which is interesting. I, 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 I regret that just slightly because I couldn't travel for Watch Out For Her. And so I, I wanted to go to Vancouver yeah. and be able to, you know, I set half of it in Vancouver. Yeah. But so this time. Especially if, in the if, winter when it's warmer there. When it's warmer. So this is, so this is, you know, if I do get to go to Michigan, it might be, I don't know, maybe around November, December. And so the weather's the same as in Toronto. So, yeah. so looking Looking back now, I think, oh, I should have said it in Hawaii or yes. Las Vegas. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, but Michigan's very much like, uh, you know, mid-northern Ontario, too, in terms of the landscape. It's not all that different. Uh, so yes, yes, you can yes. probably go not too far from your backyard. <laughs> yes, yes. That. That's also why I chose um, Chicago for Women on the Edge. I, I, I like to choose settings that feel a little familiar because yeah. it is it's expensive to, to just go. I don't, I have two kids. I can't, you know, it's very, it's not easy to just up and go and travel to do research. Right. Um, so yeah, so this book, I will at this point tell you, it is, um, a, it is very dark. Um, it's a little dirty. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it 
is about women seeking to change their lives um, and all the danger that ensues from when you take risks like that. Here, take my money. <laughs> I can't wait to buy this book. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So for um and, and I and I hope you'll come back and talk to me about about that book when it's when it's out. For my listeners, you've been through a lot. You've gotten that 20 year arc and working tirelessly with Jenny back and forth your relationship and a few misses on books that she liked but didn't like enough until finally finding something that you know she she sold to 11 different markets and then you know um, more going on with the 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 latest release in terms of you know knocking it out of the park right off the bat what sort of advice would you have given young Samantha who who was desperate and wanted to wanted to get that publishing deal wanted to wanted to write these books and the other thing I, I, I want to ask is while you're thinking about that Samantha did that Samantha know that she was going to be a thriller author or did she just want to be an author in general I'm going to actually start with your second question because okay. you and I met when I was writing, writing rom-coms yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know some of the answer to this question Growing up, I was a voracious reader. I'm still a voracious reader. I tended to like books, the darker, the better. I, I really was fascinated by the dark side. At the same time, though, I did love uh, Sweet Valley High and the rom-coms <laughs> and all, you know. Shake it up a little, right? Yeah, I like to shake it up a little bit. And the ages. I, I always knew. I, I wrote my, my first short story when I was 20, when I was 10, sorry. I'm 10 years old. 10 years old. 10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First rejection. 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Where did, did you send it to the CBC radio contest or something? Uh, kids, kids can press. Kids can press. Oh my God. You sent them a story for an anthology? I sent them a or? short story. No, to try to get it published. Oh, because I, you I, just sent them a story. <laughs> I just sent them a story. I was like, if I, for a children's book, I was like, here, I think this would make a good children's book. They were very kind in their rejection, but apparently it would not make a good children's book, which is fine. So um, that's the manuscript that's going to be worth money someday. <laughs> <laughs> Find it on eBay. <laughs> Freddie, Freddie the Flame. Anyway, that's a whole other. Story. <laughs> okay. So I, I then wrote and wrote and wrote stories through high school, and you know nothing that I ever imagined I was going to try to get published. At twenty nine, I started. Um, I was really interested in chiclet. I loved chiclet, loved it. Women's fiction chiclet, Jennifer Weiner, Brenda yeah. Janowitz, Lynn Messina. You've got all these red dress ink, the red dress ink authors. Yeah. That was my jam. So I thought I want to do this. So I wrote uh, uh, two uh, rom-coms. I signed with a New York agent, uh, not my current agent, uh, my former agent very quickly. And I was like, you know, I am that overnight success. And <laughs> no, editors, editors, they, they didn't want right. uh, those books. And so that agents and I amicably parted ways. As I went on with the process, I started writing darker and darker women's fiction. I had children. Um, it made me darker. Because everything became dangerous. The whole world. Oh, so yes, of course. When you're a parent, everything is a danger. Okay. Everything is a danger and you're scared all the time. So I started writing darker and darker women's fiction. And Woman on the Edge was actually dark women's fiction. And it was Jenny who, when we were, before she signed me, said, I really think that this would make a great thriller, and I think you can do it. And it was like she saw into my soul because I wanted to write thrillers, but I was very terrified of the daunting process to do that. Every genre is hard, but for me particularly, I was, I was very scared of the plotting. Right. But then in my head, and I've been like this ever since, I never take physical risks. I, I, I hold on to the railing walking down the stairs like I'm 95 years old. Um, but in my writing career, I take all the risks, big ones, where I don't know what's going to happen next. Because why not? Why not? Why not? 
So I took a huge risk and I, we tore the book apart and we turned it into a thriller and I, I haven't looked back since. And I love it. Writing thrillers feeds something inside me that I, 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 it's indescribable really. And reading them as well and reading them. So I found something that is my greatest passion besides me my children, of course. Um, and so the advice that I would give, I think, what stops most people is fear. Fear of rejection, fear that we're not good enough, fear that our dreams will never be realized, fear that we'll never get to where we want to be. So what I've done with the whole process is take it all word by word and step by step. I go into every publication of every book with no expectations, but big hopes. I have big hopes. I still have big hopes of other things that I want, that I dream of, and the goalpost changes. But I take it all step by step. We have very little control in publishing. We have very little control in life in general. And so if we just take it one step at a time, rally our troops of all the people we trust, and all the people who inspire us and motivate us and learning to take critique, thickening our skin, knowing that your first draft is never going to be your final draft, unless there is that magical unicorn author out there whose first draft somehow is their last draft. My books, Woman on the Edge, probably 20 drafts. Watch out for her, probably at least 10. My next one, who knows? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you for that. That was such a great conversation. Such wonderful advice for writers. Samantha, Sam, because I'm not mad yes, at you. Yes, you call me Samantha. Not... <laughs> Every time you call me Samantha, I'm like, why are you mad at me? I'm Mark? not mad at you. Samantha M. <laughs> Bailey. <laughs> no. Sam, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. And thank you. I have to say this to all your listeners who may not know. What you did have done for other writers 10 years ago, you gave me my, my start in so many ways with Kobo Writing Life. You invited me to events. You gave me a stage. You gave me a stage when no one else wanted to give me a stage. You, you gave me your place in line to meet Margaret Atwood. You invited me as a writer in residence at BEA in New York City. You you know, helped with the, the book buzz parties that Meredith Shore and Francine LaSalle and I used to host and would love to host again. So you are one of the greatest supporters of authors in existence. <laughs> and you do it just because you love doing, you don't do it to get anything back. And so it, it's just so appreciated by the community at large. Thank you kindly. I do it because the world's better off with your great stories and more people <laughs> reading them. That's why I do it. It's selfish. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was such a sweet thing for Sam to say, uh, as she said at the very end of the podcast. And and, and just listening, listening back to that just warmed my heart. Um, so, so awesome. Uh, so, so sweet and thoughtful for her to say that. But I want to reflect on two of the things that she said in our conversation. And, and the first one was about unreliable narrators. Now, I mentioned briefly that we, uh, Julie and I, when we were working on Lover's Moon, had to uh, play off of the unreliable narrator because, you know, all of the Canadian werewolf novels are first person from Michael's perspective, at least up until this point. And so we're learning a few things where he has misremembered things or that's how he perceived it. That may not have been how it was. And, and we had a lot of fun with that in, in the romance because a lot of a good romantic comedy has uh, misperceptions and, and things like that, uh, that that happen where, you know, communication is critical. And, and so I, I was thinking about what Sam said, which is so cool, is we're all, I mean, all narrators are unreliable because they're really only in their own heads. And it reminds me of this great sort of writing exercise or, or things. I, I've seen this done in, in, in various television shows and dramas and uh, occasionally in books where 
you see the same scene from two different characters' perspectives, and you're almost reading a different genre <laughs> because of their their perceptions. And I think it's a great writing exercise. If you're writing and you're stuck, one of the things you could try to do is you could try to reimagine the scene from a different person's perspective. Because usually, unless you're writing an uh, om- omnipotent um, narrator that kind of jumps around in people's heads, and I have... I have a lot of trouble with with um, with that uh, narration style where you're just there and and in everyone's heads and back and forth all over the all, all over the place. It's really hard to stay grounded for for me. I, I've read a few books like that and, and found I've I've had a a lot of difficulty because I'm usually you know sitting uh, you know co-pilot <laughs> with with whoever's perspective we're looking at. But take a scene. You're having str- you're having trouble. You're writing a scene from a certain perspective. Okay. A scratch pad wherever it is beside it start writing that scene from the other character's perspective that may get you past that hump that may allow you to see something about the other character that can help you with that perspective you're trying to write that's something you can try I, but i think it's just a, an interesting exercise in general is to always remember that this is not the truth we are writing this is that character's truth about how they see themselves in that situation at that particular moment. Really great thing for for me to reflect on. And I was so excited that Samantha and I got to talk about unreliable narrators, but oh my God, she's, she does a brilliant job of this in, um, in, well, especially in this second novel. But, um, I suppose it's to say that the reality is, is our perception of that reality. And so the second thing I wanted to reflect on is just considering, uh, you know, she, she talked about the fear that stops us. And I was so inspired. I, w- I was so inspired when I heard from her that she had that first book with Simon and Schuster uh, Canada, when that first came out and I got, I got an advanced reader's copy from her publicist. And I was so thrilled because I knew how hard she worked at this and I just love that she didn't give up that she believed in it and she overcame the fears because there, there there are those fears that stop us what if I will only ever continue to get rejections what if I can wallpaper not just my neighborhood what if I can wallpaper the entire city the entire county whatever the case may be there's so many times that we let fears stop us from doing things from saying things from being things we hold ourselves back out of fear. I'm going to I'm going to reflect back on uh now I'm going to reflect back on this is this is more related to do with love, but I think love and fear are two powerful emotions. I've edited anthologies in the Fiction River series. One of them was Feel the Fear where I wanted people to reflect on fear uh based stories that were all about that. And the other one was Feel the Love. And and Feel the Fear was not meant to be a horror anthology. It was about to be about the emotion of fear. And Feel the Love was not meant to be a romance anthology. It was meant to be about the feeling of love. And so there were horror stories in the original. And in Feel the Love, there were romance stories, but they weren't all of those genres. So um, that's a long aside to say the thing that, the, what are we afraid of? The fear that stops us. And, and I go back to Perfect Strangers. This is Balky and Larry. It's a TV show from the late 80s the early 90s, Bronson Pinchot and Mark Lynn Baker. And uh, Cousin Larry, played by Mark Lynn Baker, was an uptight, anal, sort of anxious guy, wanted to play by the rules, etc. And Valky Bartokamas, played by Bronson Pinchot, was from a you know some fictional Greek island somewhere. Very much like a Greek island, I should say. Uh, uh, it was called Mepos. And, and he was um, a naive sort of uh, fish out of water in America, didn't quite know the language very well, so he used a lot of idioms incorrectly, which caused a lot of humor. But he was also pure of heart and, and spirit. And there, there was this beautiful episode early on in the, in the series where Larry's sister, younger sister, comes into play. And you know the family dynamics uh, that happen. And... And Balky is having an honest discussion with, um, because he's not going to see uh, his sister Elaine has made a decision and, and Larry doesn't agree with it because he always looked out for her. He was always the big brother who protected her. And he's angry at her because he loves her and cares about her so much. 
and Valky and Larry are having this conversation, and Valky says, you love her, don't you? He says, yes, with all my heart, I love my sister so much. He goes, do you ever tell her that? When was the last time you told her that? And 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 he's kind of like, Valky, like, we're Americans, we don't do that. And, and Valky said, if you love her, why are you keeping it to yourself? Why why are you keeping that in? What, what, what good does it do when you don't share that, when you don't express that, when you don't give that to something? And that's the thing is it's, it's, it's infinite, right? You can keep giving and keep giving and keep giving. And, and it's almost, when I think about the fear that stops us, it's the same thing. Why are you withholding when you, when you care about somebody, when you love somebody, um, sh- expressing that, sharing that with them? And actually help them feel good, I mean, particularly when it's a family member or someone like like that. And obviously, a stranger on the subway or whatever—that's a little bit creepier or different, right? But uh, I'm, I'm thinking about that in that in that aspect of uh, of 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 the people in your life that 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 know you love them or should love them, but actually saying it to them. I, I say it to my 18 year old son all the time, and and I don't care if it's embarrassing uh, to him. Uh, I, I, I tend to do it quietly when it's in front of uh, other people. So uh, he hears it because uh, I'm not trying to embarrass him, but I don't ever want him not to know uh, that I love him. And, and, and that's an important lesson, obviously, for the, the people in your life that, um, that you love. But I think about the sort of fear in the same way. The, the things that we fear because of, they're these anticipated uh, and I'm not talking about taking ridiculous risks. I'm just talking about the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of, well, I was going to do NaNoWriMo, but I'm afraid I'm never going to finish it. So what if you never finish it? Do you know how many NaNoWriMo projects I've never finished? I didn't, well, it, at least in the in, during that NaNoWriMo period, the first book in the Canadian Werewolf series. <laughs> it took me 10 years before I finally finished it. Um, but had I been afraid to start, I never would have started and that book never would have happened. We stop ourselves from doing great things. We stop ourselves from achieving things because of the fear of what might happen if I do this. And the worst case scenario is you've written a bunch of words and it's not finished. You've written some words. It's always a good thing for you as a writer to get more words out there. Uh, Submitting it submitting that manuscript to a publisher oh my god someone's going to read my book that is a terrifying it's a terrifying feeling it, it never goes away that first time somebody reads <laughs> reads that writing uh, first time you push the button to self-publish and, and i was talking to someone uh, recently who talked about okay so uh, you know, before we do the novel well let's do a few smaller projects let's just go through the project process push the buttons publish it just see what it's like the world didn't end <laughs> My book went live on Amazon, etc. Um, all of those things. I just, I, I want uh, to reflect on those two things. Um, uh, you know, embracing embracing that which we love, and not allowing fear to prevent us from trying, from embracing, from reaching for things that we want. I look back at the hard work and the effort and the energy and the enthusiasm and the belief and the spirit and the conviction. And the support that Samantha had all those years. And I, it makes that t- success that I see in her, it makes that taste so much better. And I love seeing success in my friends. I love seeing success in other writers, particularly when I know just how much they put into it and just how dedicated they are. And again, like I said to Samantha, just how awesome books are that, yay, <laughs> more people get to read your stuff and the world became a better place. Don't let fear hold you back from those things that you are most passionate about. I'm going to hark back to one last anecdote or one last saying, and this comes from uh, a dear friend, James Owen, who is a beautiful motivational speaker, beautiful person. And he says, if you really want to do something, no one can stop you. But if you really don't want to do something, no one can help you. And as James also goes on to say, and I'm paraphrasing, when people see that you really want something, that you really want to do something, no one can stop you. And in fact, when people can see that you want to do something, 
they usually will find ways to support you, to prop you up, and to help you. Just like Samantha did in her writer journey. Well, that's the end of this reflection. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Samantha Bailey and the accompanying reflections and other window dressing that I throw into each episode. (laughs) Thanks so much for joining me here on episode 275. If you like the podcast, please leave a review on whatever podcatcher you happen to listen to podcasts on, or better yet, share this episode or others with a friend that you think would find value in these stark reflections. And so, until next week, and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. Nothing.